Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar exploring technology data use and privacy in the social housing sector. Today's event sponsored by Homelink will look at the advantages and implications of the use of smart technology in social housing. We'll be looking to pick up tips from landlords who are already leading the way, um, investigate what the future might hold and delve into the ethical and security considerations that are such a crucial part of the conversation. So absolutely stacks to, to get through um, this morning. And I'll just start by um, introducing uh, both the topic and, and some of the themes that we'll be looking to explore today. Um, so obviously for social landlords, uh, social landlords, the asset management advantages of using smart technology to manage homes are, are absolutely huge. Uh, this could be everything from using monitoring systems such as leak detectors or smart thermostats for maintenance and environmental issues to monitoring building data as part of the golden thread of information about our buildings that the government will require moving forwards. Then, of course, there's supported housing and sensors used to check on resident safety. Um, so a whole raft of, uh, of potential uses and, 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 and many more besides. And clearly all of these bring potential benefits for residents too, um, including help, helping people to regulate uh, the temperature and their, uh, of their homes and bills. Um, uh, so yeah, kind of a raft of advantages both to the sector and to, to, to residents potentially um, if used correctly. As mentioned, however, there are important ethical considerations for the sector to take into account when building and adapting um, smart homes. Earlier this year, the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation launched a barometer to analyse the opportunities, risks and challenges associated with innovation, data use and privacy. Among the issues flagged in its report are uh, a lack of transparency about how data is used, the trust in organisations and institutions and concerns about the quality of data and related infrastructure. So today's discussion will pick up on, on all of these themes and more and give you some tips and thinking to take back to your own organisations um, and, and, and guide your, your, your thoughts moving forwards. So, yeah, we've got an absolutely fab panel lined up today in order to do that um, and to guide us through that conversation. We'll be hearing from Julian Schwarzenbach, chair of the BCS Data Management Special, uh, Specialism Group at the Charles Institute of IT. Daniel Hardy, Project Coordinator at Leeds Council and part of the City Digital Partnerships team that works across the council and the four Leeds-based NHS, NHS organisations focused on the delivery of integrated care via digital means. Uh, we'll also be hearing from Chris Jones, the co-founder and uh, COO of um, Homelink, and Lucy Fraser, the Head of Innovation with Auburn Housing Society. Um, so a range of um, voices and experience um, are there to, to guide us through the conversation today. Um, and before we start, a reminder that this is absolutely um, uh, your opportunity as well to ask the questions that are going to be most useful to you in your organisations moving forward. Um, so, yeah, help, helping to guide your thinking or, or to ask the, the, the questions that you're kind of um, grappling with um, at the moment. So please do use that Q&A box attached throughout um, and I'll pick up on as many questions as, as possible following the presentations. So yeah, do, do, do get uh, asking away and we'll pick up on uh, the, 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 as many questions as possible um, uh, very, very shortly. Um, which brings us very nicely to those presentations. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're just about to, to kick off. Um, and I would ask Julian, please, um, uh, I will hand over to you. Welcome and the floor is yours. Please take it away. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Julian Schwarzenbach. Um, today I'm sort of wearing a BCS hat. I'm chair of the BCS Data Management Specialist Group. Um, but bear in mind the topic, some of the other activities that I get involved in are actually quite relevant, quite pertinent. So I'm part of the Institute of Asset Management. I'm a UK chapter committee member. I'm also involved in various standards related activities and cross industry activities uh, for BSI, ISO, and others. And just a quick reminder today that what I'm presenting are my views and not necessarily those of the BCS. Um, my day job is that I'm a consultant, I'm an author, I'm a lecturer, I'm involved in standards development, as I said, um, but I go across a number of different domains. So that's both data management and asset management, but also looking at information security. Some of the clients and organisations I've been involved with include Crossrail, Network Rail, AirGrid, E.ON, HS1, and a number of smaller housing associations. Um, but one of the things that perhaps makes me a little bit different to some people in this space is that I take a very technology agnostic viewpoint. So I'm actually less interested in the technology somebody is using, but more interested in what are the outcomes that they're achieving. So thinking about today, the 
title is how can social housing be smart about technology data use and privacy and i think the key word here is being smart so technology will provide many opportunities and potential benefits and if you're assessing a new technology i'm sure the sales team for that technology will tell you lots and lots of benefits that their uh, system their technology will deliver for you but I think you need to think about the fact that there are a number of, it's not a panacea, risks, there are many downsides that risk the organisation. So being smart actually means being a bit sceptical and being a bit cautious. Being smart means taking a long-term view and thinking about the enterprise perspective of any solution that you're talking about. So what I'll do now is I'll now dip into a few success factors to consider and also a few areas of caution. So for success factors, I think one of the first ones is bearing in mind that we are intruding on people's homes. Openness is absolutely essential. So residents know what is being monitored, how the data is going to be used, how they can end monitoring if they're not comfortable. And you need to be able to actually demonstrate the ethical approaches that you're taking. Above all, residents need to have some ability to opt out and it needs to be easy. So you need to be actually very, very clear about the benefits that that are being um, delivered from any technology monitoring solution. Are they benefits the organization? How does the re resident benefit? And you need to be clear about, are you monitoring the property? Are you monitoring the residents or a bit of both? So talking about benefits, you need to think and be very careful about making sure you have a very realistic business case to understand, is the technology that you're going to be providing based on the cost, based on the benefits, actually is it a viable approach. And what you'll typically find is in most organizations, in most situations, um, you'll start with a lot of uncertainty, and as you go through doing a bit more assessment and you get more certainty, both certainty that comes around the costs and the potential benefits. And a key thing that you need to do as uh, owners or as prescribing parties is you need to be um, review the benefits case on a regular basis to determine, does the benefits case still stack up? Do we still carry on proceeding with the project as intended? You also need to recognize that you're part of a complex organization and therefore any solutions that are being developed or being proposed need to be part of that organizational landscape. Um, you need to think about how to maximize the benefits and minimize any rework or integration problems in the future. I'm gonna dip into a few of those a little bit later. But one of the key things you need to think about is trying to make sure that you're using consistent data standards. So even if you aren't integrating the technologies that you're employing uh, with other systems immediately, you need to make sure that you have that capability. If you've got property IDs in use within the organization, any monitoring system needs to use those property IDs and other related information so that the information can be shared. But also, above all, you need to make sure that you're taking a security-minded approach. Um, bearing in mind what we're monitoring, that the fact is that there are a number of security implications to consider. And this isn't just about cyber security, but this is also about information security, thinking about what pattern of life information may be being picked up from the monitoring. Um, if the pattern of life information is maybe published a little bit too widely, then you could be giving somebody information about when somebody is in or not in a property which therefore may be information either for a burglar or for somebody who might be doing other malicious acts. And finally, on the um, success factors, you need to recognize that any approach that's being taken is potentially open to audit. So you might have the ICO coming in asking questions about what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're treating personal information of your residents. So you need to start right from the out outset with a clear view of how you're gonna make sure that you can actually demonstrate what you're doing and, and respond to any audit requests. So a few cautions. Um, one of the things you need to be very cautious of is about short-term solutions, making sure that any solution that's being adopted actually is thinking through in the long term. How can you sustain it? How can you make sure that you can actually support and build on the technology in the future? There is no point having one whiz kid in the organization who knows how the technology works and they leave to get a, a better job somewhere else, and you've got nobody left who actually can understand and use your technology. You also need to adopt a bit of asset management thinking. So having one installation and looking after one installation, maybe as a proof of concept, is relatively straightforward. If you scale that up to, let's say, a 1,000 properties, 
and the sensors or the technology used maybe has got a three or a five year life cycle, you also need to recognize that in five years time, you've potentially got a thousand bits of kit to go out and replace. So your thinking needs to be long term, not just of how do we install and deliver something now, but how are we going to sustain it in the future? Also bear in mind that um, there's a current fad for everybody thinking it's Internet of Things, it's wireless sensors. Don't lose sight of the fact that sometimes wired sensors may give a just as good a reading as you need from the property, but actually you've taken away, away another failure mechanism by removing the wireless technology and you've got something that's potentially a bit more robust. So don't rule out the fact that sometimes wired sensors may actually give you just as much value, in fact, potentially more. Also be a little bit cautious in terms of any sensors that you're using only deliver information based on what they're, they're sensing. So temperature sensing will only tell you the temperature at the point where the sensor is, not necessarily the high and low points within a property. Moisture sensing may tell you what the moisture is in a wall, for example, but it won't tell you that there's a burst pipe somewhere. So you need to be very careful and not lose sight of the fact that sometimes there'll be additional monitoring needed of the property, which might be human-based monitoring. I've mentioned before about audits and the ICO, so you need to think through very carefully about the privacy implications of any monitoring. And you need to make sure that residents understand what you're doing and why and how, and above all, that they've got an easy route, a clear route, where you can opt out. Potentially, you want to make sure that they don't just opt out without talking to you, that they maybe register their concerns first and you have a bit of a chat about it. And if they're not comfortable, that they then are able to opt out. I think also going back to the point I was saying earlier about business case and being a bit, a bit cautious is keep on being cautious, particularly about the business case. Um, technology vendors may be quite optimistic in terms of the benefits that they will forecast. They will be optimistic about the installation costs and the running costs. And I think you need to be very skeptical and cautious to make sure that as real costs start to come to, to light, that you've got a clear view about uh, what you're doing, whether the benefits case does continue to be viable for the technology that you're looking to implement. But above all, just summarising really is be smart, be sceptical. Don't take anybody's word for it that something's great. You need to test it in your own context. So uh, I'm not saying don't use technology, but just be cautious in its application. So that's, uh, that's my little opener anyway. Thank you. Thanks very much, Julian. Um, huge, huge amounts to kind of pick up on in the, uh, the, the Q&A that, that, that follows and, and, and a lot of takeaways uh, for, from that. And, and I, I hope you'll get into some of the, the, the specifics. Um, so it's certainly got a huge, huge number of questions myself that I, I, I want to ask as a, as a result. Th thanks very much, Julian. And, and just a reminder to everybody, please do use that Q&A box because absolutely um, uh, any questions prompted by these uh, presentations or um, yeah, your, your opportunity really to, to, to take um, uh, to, to take away information back to your own organisation. So do do keep uh, questions coming in in that that Q and A box. Um, thanks very much, Julian. Very much appreciated. Uh, great uh, great start. And and uh, now we will hand over to Daniel from from Leeds Council. So Daniel, welcome. And uh, it is over to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, Hope everybody's doing well. Good afternoon, actually. Apologies. Good afternoon, just. Hope everybody's doing okay. Um, my name is Daniel Hardy, and as mentioned earlier, I work in the City Digital Partnerships team in Leeds, and we have a number of we're involved in a number of health projects. Um, I'm just going to start by giving you a bit of background on the housing situation in Leeds, and then I'm going to talk some more about a project that we're involved in at the moment, which is called GovTech. So, Leeds City Council has 56,000 properties. Um, which are dotted across an area that covers 550 square miles. Um, and we have an in-house repairs team that covers two thirds of the city. Um, the housing service has six key priorities, which are increasing the number of affordable homes in the city, improving the energy efficiency and quality of homes, including those in the private rented sector, and reducing the number of empty homes within the city supporting people to live independently and minimizing homelessness, creating sustainable communities by managing neighborhoods effectively and tackling antisocial behavior, domestic abuse and crime, using housing options to improve people's health and promoting healthy lifestyles, and meeting the housing needs of older people so that they can live independently in the home of their choice. Oh, God. 
Um, we are in currently investigating the use of IoT devices through a, gov a project called GovTech. Um, GovTech is a government-backed government scheme that supports local authorities to work with SMEs in the tech sector to investigate how we can find solutions to pr problems that they, we're, we're experiencing. Um, the work is based on a problem statement, and our original problem statement was, how might we use technology to monitor the condition and quality of the council's housing stock to proactively identify and prevent adverse environmental issues that might impact on the tenant's health? So GovTech, is, we're in phase two of GovTech currently. In phase one, we worked with five companies who undertook a great deal of discovery work to understand the issues and formulate a way to tackle the problems we were experiencing. We then reviews, reviewed their plans um, that each of the five companies put forward and looked at how they felt they could use sensor technology to improve this situation. Um, and then, so once we undertook this review, which was done with colleagues from housing and representatives from the government digital service, we identified two companies who would move forward to phase two and they would develop that and the basically phase two sees them develop their off their plans into an offer and a, into a commercial offer so they develop their solutions into a commercial offer so from the original companies five companies from phase one we picked two who would, would work with for a further 12 months and we're halfway through that now um, the two companies that we decided on were AwareTag and HomeLink, and I think it's fair to say they were the standouts from phase one, so it wasn't a massive shock when they were the two that went forward. Um, AwareTag are based in Bristol, and their solution is based on Bluetooth, which transmits data from sensors in the properties. And HomeLink, are also, who are also based in, Broome, in Bristol, have a similar approach, um, but they use LoRaWAN sensors. Um, and so that's been doubly helpful for us because it's not only, you know, starting down the line of looking at how we can use this technology to improve the internal environment in properties. It's also actually been a good test of our LoRaWAN network. So it's come back with flying colors, but actually it's also identified some areas where we perhaps need to uh, fill in some gaps. So that's been a sort of added bonus to this. Um, both the approaches use sensors to measure temperature, humidity, and air, co air quality. Um, we approached this very much on a voluntary basis. So with the help from our tenant engagement team, we asked tenants to volunteer to take part and we artificially split the city down the middle. Um, we felt this was a good idea to avoid any confusion because we, what we didn't want was uh, tenants in the same street having sensors from a different company and asking questions about why that might be the case or you know wondering why theirs had arrived and somebody else's hadn't and all those kind of things so basically homelink are predominantly focusing on uh, properties in the west of the city and aware tag on properties in the east uh, aware tag have got 30 properties in have got sensors in 30 properties so far and they have used a process of posting the uh, sensors out to tenants so it's a self-installation approach and while I think that was really successful at the beginning it's kind of slowed down more so now whereas Homelink have adept, adopted a an approach where they work with us and do it during the voids process and I think that took longer to get off the ground but actually they're sort of streaking ahead now so they've got uh, sensors in 48 properties both Aware tag and home link install sensors in the kitchen and living room and bathroom as a minimum. Although I think there is the odd property where they have, there are more than those, but this sort of initial initial number is three per property. Um, so as I said, we appealed for volunteers, and the people taking place are doing so at their own at their own. Uh, you know, they've chosen to take part, um, and both companies have created a resident app that supports the approach. This means that the tenants can view their data. And that was one of the things we were very conscious of, that the tenants should be able to see what we're collecting. So it might not be in the absolute granular detail that we might need it in, but they are getting a picture of what's happening within their properties. And, the, and this is helping them to take actions to improve the internal environment. Um, obviously, in any kind of, in, in this approach at all, you need the agreement from the tenant and that we use their data 
And while there is an argument that you could use public task for this, because you know you have the right to take actions to improve the standard of the property, we were focused purely on specific consent, and we wanted to get the go-ahead from tenants when they signed up. We didn't want to this to be an our. We wanted them to volunteer, not us, kind of to be seen to be forcing it on them. And going back to what Julian said, that idea of sort of what else might we be might we be doing it for it and could be a bit could raise suspicion so yes it was very much a, a, a volunteer approach um one of the tenants has recently been in touch with one of the companies to say they no longer want to take part um because they are moving out of the city and so this is this has sort of been very timely really obviously we don't want people to disappear but this has been quite timely because it will hopefully answer one of the issues that we've been quite sort of it has been nagging at us in the background really i think which is the idea of how do you how do you put that differentiation in place between one tenant's data and a new tenant's data so we are working with the company involved to try and get the whoever comes into that property to continue to be part of this this proof of concept scheme because we want to understand how do you make sure the data you know, stops from one day to the next. So when they move out, how do we make sure that that, that is the end of what they what the readings we take from them, and and then how do we start from the new one? But also to understand how the how a different makeup of the sort of family unit might impact the data as well. So it's so while it's it's causing a number of conversations, it's actually very positive this because it is answering some sort of overlying questions that. that we didn't really have a we uh, we're still thinking about how do we get to the bottom of these um as i've already mentioned both companies sensors measure temperature humidity and air quality and they've helped us identify um some areas where we need to take action so some of some in some of the properties there are things that we need to work on but also to make us think about what we do with regard to uh how we sort of sorry i'll start again so it makes us think about what we need to do but also highlighted some other problems as well such as fuel poverty um we've had some really good feedback from residents um so things such as decided i need to turn the extract extractor fan in, on in the bedroom occasionally is always seems to be sad humidity is too high that was a comment about the the way the resident app represents things with smiley faces um and also one very interesting one, which was about a, a tenant who was kind of distrusting of the idea, um, but said they'd noticed a big shift in their thinking and they've gone from an absolute no to a strong maybe now. Um, so that's been really useful. Um, I think just just very quickly to finish up, um, the next steps for WearTag and HomeLink, the companies involved, are to get through the alpha assessment, which will help them understand where they are from the government digital view, services view and then they're focusing on building that business case that, to show that their solution is the one that should be procured and from us we need to understand how we look at the way we need to change the way we work we need to move from a reactive service to a more proactive one um, and use data and insight to schedule jobs and we also need to investigate how we do this at scale do we split the city into areas um, which could potentially lead to having different ways of working different parts of the city or do we perhaps adopt a property approach assuming you know that it's easier in, in high rise because you do you know in one day and try and blitz through them or something like that so that's where i think we need to be next um hopefully this is pretty useful uh, and look forward to the questions thank you Very much so. Th thanks, Daniel, uh, for, for a great presentation. Um, and we've got some questions coming in now. Um, please do keep them coming. Again, uh, this, this is all designed to be as useful as, as possible to, to, to you in your jobs. Um, so do, do uh, get the questions coming in and we'll get through as many as possible very shortly. Um, so yeah, th thank you very much, uh, Daniel. Uh, and uh, yeah, a number of key points we'll pick up on, on, on in a few moments. Um, Chris, welcome. Um, uh, good afternoon. And uh, the floor is yours. Please take it away. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks. Thank you, Daniel, for saying we were stand out from the first phase. I'm sure WearTag will be happy with that as well. Um, so I'm just going to go through a quick presentation on um, our, our sort of, uh, you know, not I know I've touched on things of leads, but just generally, you know, our experience in scaling smart homes in the social housing sector. So I'm just going to cover off. Um, 
and the slide loads. Yeah, I'm just going to cover off a few different things. So um, around ethics, which I'm sure we'll get questions on, uh, and we've already talked about a little bit, GDPR and privacy. Uh, an example we've had that, that's outside of uh, Leeds, uh, where we are now and, and where we're going. So in terms of our um, ethics approach, our, um, we've been working with Bristol City University, a guy called Sam Collier, uh, to do some research. So we've, we've interviewed, um, surveyed over 500 social housing residents across the UK and 50 social landlords. Uh, we've just tried to understand you know, their, how they view IoT in terms of its usefulness, the comfort, how they view their home, their relationship with the landlord, um, and, and a number of other things like demographics. So just and this research covered a lot of different um, uh, a lot of different uh, aspects, but just in terms of uh, usefulness, uh, just just a couple of little things that we can bring out and from a usefulness perspective. Uh, connected fire alarms were you know these are some of the technologies that sort of came across as the residents would see very useful. Uh, so connected fire alarms were ex seen as extremely useful, uh, all the way through to things like boilers, smart meters, temperature sensors humidity and indoor air quality. And when we followed up, um, had follow up questions of residents and explained why, you know, what humidity you know, is and, and, and why that could be in, uh, of use, uh, we've seen that, that they've, they've, they found those even more useful as well. In terms of comfort with technology, um, again, uh, we we're quite uh, you know, glad to see that a lot of residents actually already very, very comfortable with um, a lot of different technologies, IoT technologies that are going to be used um, in, in housing, particularly those that are around sort of uh, life safety, health um, uh, and, and potentially saving them money as well. So some of the key recommendations that came out of this ethics research, so involving those that, um, that, that are affected by this decision making. So part of what we've done is do, to do this ethics research to, un, to understand you know, what's acceptable to residents and what isn't so that we can then build that into our products and advise landlords um, to, to make sure that they're you know, doing things in the way that residents are happy with. Uh, we need to build transparency and uh, ensure transparency to build trust. So that, again, as has been touched on, you know, go beyond GDPR perhaps and, and really explain exactly why you're doing it, what you're doing, uh, and, and to build trust there. And we found that by providing information directly to residents, uh, that helps build uh, trust because obviously it's extremely transparent to show them exactly what's being collected. Uh, also, to use data to empower them, not have power over them. Again, you know, by providing information directly to them, you know, you build trust by trusting uh, people, uh, and you know, you're able to sort of help them take care of their own environmental circumstances in this case. Uh, and then also to be clear and transparent on the, the, the data purpose and ownership, which is almost covered by GDPR. Uh, another kind of challenge, you know, in scaling uh, IoT has been touched on already, but GDPR. So. Um, for those that are unfamiliar, it's collection. It's all about collecting and processing personal information and the legal framework that surrounds that. Uh, so, you know, what is the correct approach? Well, it really depends on the landlord a little bit, but also depends on the data. So it's not necessarily one approach for all types of data. It might be consent for some types of data. It could be public uh, task, um, uh, you know, um, legitimate interest and a number of other um, aspects like contractual. There's actually eight lawful basis for collecting personal information. Uh, probably, you know, landlords don't get consent for a lot of information that they uh, already collect and, you know, you wouldn't give consent to the NHS. Um, there as well. Some things obviously would, would require and, and some things don't. Uh, public task and legitimate interest, you know, it's really um, particularly public task. If there's something set out in law that you're needed to, you know, required to do as a landlord, then th there's a, there's a, you know, you don't necessarily need to have consent uh, to collect that information. Uh, and then just to um, take a quote from the information, the ICA website, now, consent is one lawful basis for processing their alternatives. Consent's not inherently better or more important than the others. Um, if consent's difficult, you should consider using an alternative. Now, I'm not saying that um, you know you shouldn't uh, you know have have a strategy where residents opt in and out to IoT. That that you know you can always treat that separately. In terms of the lawful basis, and we're working with Trows and Hamlins uh, on this as well, uh, which which we'll publish. Uh, you can collect, for example, your um, uh, you know data from a GDPR perspective under public task or legitimate interest in, in most cases, uh, that's, that's okay of IoT data. But you might also, um, as a landlord, decide that you want to have, you know, give residents the option uh, to, you know, prevent data from being collected in their homes. And they can be viewed in, in two separate uh, things. They're not necessarily intertwined. 
um, which is important in terms of um, scalability and processes. And so, so an area that would be relevant for collecting IT information and under those aspects would be, you know, things like the Homes Act, you know, there's a requirement on the landlord to, 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 to ensure fire safety, carbon monoxide, um, you know, there's no damp, uh, ventilation's adequate, there's no excess cold and heat. Uh, just looking at two of the, the sensor types that we're scaling at the moment, um, quite uh, quite significantly, I'll go through numbers briefly at the end. Uh, smoke and CO alarms, you know, clearly there's maintenance, compliance, alarm activations, and asset management there. And then some of the environment sensors, which is a new product that um, EI is uh, bringing out with, with ACO uh, and ourselves, uh, and some of the stuff that we're testing with with Leeds and and and, and elsewhere. Uh, you know, these provide insights around condensation, damp and mold, energy efficiency, fuel poverty, excess cold and heat. Uh, ventilation uh, and void and, and they're all kind of covered uh, un under some of those clearly you know from an ethics point of view we've, we've heard from others and, and part of our recommend you know that those uh, the researchers recommendations is to you know empower residents build trans ensure transparency the information themselves and what we've really created you know what i like to call a, a sort of fitbit for your home's health uh, which which and your home's health has a big impact on your own health and your family's health so there's a big win-win here where residents can you know l uh, get the information they need to make positive changes uh, build that trust and transparency with with landlords, and we've seen that the resident apps done that with with some of the feedback we're getting from residents in Leeds. Um, but also the knock on effect is if they're taking better care of their own home, then that has you know when you when you talk about preventative maintenance, it's really the user of the vehicle or the user of the the, the device rather than a, an engineer that needs to do those preventative maintenance tasks. So clearly the resident you know is, is going to be a big part of that preventative maintenance strategy, and this really is you know a key way of doing that. Uh, looking at exam a quick example of where we've had uh, success previously uh, with Wolverhampton Homes where we provided information on their homes directly to the residents and told them, explained to them what it means and what they can do about it as the app now does. Um, we saw a 20%, almost 20% improvement in ventilation, reduced damp and mold risk across any um, rooms where there was issues and across those homes where there were issues. We identified a mold issue that was caused by structural problems. So that was a leak rather than, you know, um, high humidity and low ventilation. So clearly that, you know, if the, if the landlord thought that there was the resident's problem, it could have, um, you know, worsened that relationship and they'd also be liable under the Homes Act. Uh, identified a long-term unexpected void risk and identified homes with poor thermal rating for potential investment. So an overview of where we're at at the moment. So, um, you know, working with ACO, uh, they have uh, 8,000 uh, systems installed. So this isn't, you know, contracts or people that have bought gateways or the potential over the next year. This is currently in the UK. Um, there are 8,000 connected uh, smart homes in social housing um, using the ACO system. And that's since uh, January last year. And that's 46,000 connected devices. So this this is scaling, it's currently scaling, uh, and these are the issues that we're, we're discussing now. You know, where are things going? You know, what's the interest there? So clearly there's a lot of in scale and interest around connected fire alarms and CO alarms, which is uh, where the probably 95% of the previous stats I showed you are. The environment sensors are now, uh, we're seeing them scale uh, quite quickly as well. We're also doing some R&D work to understand how we can bolt on additional technologies to improve uh, telecare offerings, which we're doing with Sterling Council at the moment, an R&D project. Uh, and even outside of the sector, so we're working with Cardiff City Council uh, to monitor the air quality of classrooms in schools because um, it's like a known um, uh, thing in uh, science research that uh, poor ventilation in classrooms is, is, is quite a big issue and, and COVID's um, accelerated the concern around that. So we're doing some work with, 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 with them as well. And we're also doing some work with the NHS in connecting um, uh, hospital in Manchester to, from, from both a maintenance and a patient and staff uh, wellbeing point of view as well. So it really does feel like, you know, I, there's a lot happening with IT and um, yeah, there's still, there's still challenges to solve, but it's quite a bright um, future. Thank you. Fabulous. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. And we've uh, we've got a, um, a, a number of questions coming in now. Um, just a reminder: do keep them coming in, uh, and and obviously relating to some of the, the presentations we've heard so far. Um, so yeah, pl plenty to, to 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 ask people about in a, in a few moments' time. But do keep them coming in, so we, we get through as many of your questions and make it as useful as possible um, uh, to, to 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 you um, um, moving forwards as well. So um, yeah, that just a reminder that Q and A box is there. Thank you very much, Chris. 
Um, Lucy, well, welcome. Um, good, good afternoon. Uh, and yeah, I, the, it's, it's over to you. Um, so yeah, please take it away. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Lucy Fraser. I'm Head of Innovation at Alban Housing. Uh, and we cover a geographical area about the size of Belgium, but it's basically at the very top of Scotland. So we've got a really wide uh, area to cover with uh, areas where we've got one house and areas where we've got um, thousands of houses that are in the most deprived in Scotland. And we came at this from a slightly different angle. We came at this from a wellness angle because we had a tenant who died in one of our houses and lay unfound for over a year. And there was a big concern at that time about what housing associations and social landlords could do to prevent that happening uh, going forward. Um, we actually spoke to quite a lot of people um, around the world in Singapore and in Canada, and we realised that it wasn't just a, a Scottish Highland problem. So um, we then thought, how, how are we going to deal with this? And we we started with the tenant. So we asked the tenant what would be acceptable to them and what wouldn't be acceptable to them. And um, we did a couple of pieces of research and, and found out that um, that wearables weren't an answer. They wanted uh, things to happen ambiently. Um, they wanted, they didn't want the public sector to own it, and they didn't want the private sector to own it. So we went forward with a, with the model, the intention that the model be a social business model owned by the people themselves. So on the back of that, we got city region deal funding, and we started looking at how we could support people in their own houses. Um, and the first thing we did was to make sure that the, the tenants owned the data. So they had to sign up to do, to do that through a tenancy agreement and lawyers. And this was before any GDPR was coming through. So we worked really closely with ICO. Um, who were really, really helpful. So I would, I would say to anybody, don't be scared to go to them. In fact, go to them first because they will tell you. They, they say that what they, what they're trying to do is to help you do it. ICO should never stop you doing anything. They're there to make sure that you just do it legally. So we, we worked with them, and we put a, a, a mesh of sensors in the house that followed people in their day-to-day -day activities. Um, and, and we grew that uh, and we looked at, could we tell how long somebody's taking to make their lunches, how long they were taking to shower, how long they were taking to dress in the morning. So what we were doing was trying to ascertain where people were on um, the life curve. So we were working with Newcastle University and their life curve, um, of which we're all on, and you get a to a certain place in the life curve, and then your chances of falling, for instance, uh, starts to rise exponentially exponentially. So we, we were looking at different sensors and what we're going to do and how we were going to develop it. And we realised pretty quickly that most systems out there um, took the data from you and kept it, regardless if they said that they didn't. So your Samsung smart things, your, your, your Apples, your, your all of those, they retain the, the data that you are gathering and they, they have a caveat in, in their back ends that say they do it to test the system, but basically they keep the data. So we had to try and work out what was the best method that we could do to constrict the data that was going out. Um, and we used the Samsung smart thing in the end because their data gathering was smaller than anybody else's. Um, but we put in our own mm -hmm. sensors. We didn't use a package. Um, and we uh, took the data and we put the data into the same storage facility as NHS uses up in Scotland. Um, all of that was quite controversial at the time, um, but we went forward and then we started looking at how we could develop algorithms. And all of this has been fed back to the tenant. So the tenant has a, a screen that they can log into with a personal number and they can see their day-to-day -day activity. And so can their families or any of their carers who the tenant chooses can see that. So one of the really quick um, results from this was families being able to have peace of mind because they knew that their, their elderly parent or, or vulnerable person was alive and, and going about their daily business. So you could see quite quickly routines um, over a day or a week or a month, uh, completely frightening how... Um, 
predictable we all are. We all think that we are doing things um, differently every day and generally you're not. So you can pick up patterns. And it's that patterns of behaviour that we then looked at. Um, and we are working with universities to develop AI. And the first piece of AI we've developed is around falls predictions. So it's not about people falling, it's about measuring the chances of people falling as, as they become more vulnerable as they get older or as their disease progresses. Um, and that was another thing that was came across really quickly was that we had anticipated that this kind of system would only be used for elderly and vulnerable. And actually, when we were doing it, one of the first people that used it was 18 years old with a life limiting disease. So it was it was very much something that could be used across the board. And um, we got city region deal, as I said, and now we're in the point of where we're doing a DPIA, a, a data processing impact assessment with the NHS. I hope none of you ever have to do that. I hope that what we're the pain that we're going through at the moment will stop the rest of you having to do it. But um, it's uh, one of the first housing associations that will be doing it with the NHS. And the idea is that the NHS, the GP surgery and the integrated care teams out in the community can use the data that we are gathering in the social housing to support to create support packages um, and and to prevent as much as possible um, major incidents and emergencies and manage people into better accommodation or with better care packages. So to give you a real life example, we put in, in one of our trials, we had eight houses that were um, had a warden in them and the previously to us going in they had one sensor on the door and if that sensor hadn't been activated by midday then somebody would go and check when we put our sensors in the person the warden could actually log on in the morning see everybody see immediately if anybody was having any difficulty if if, if they had fallen in the shower and weren't moving or anything like that um, and could intervene quite quickly but on top of that what happened was that one of one of the um, tenants had what everybody thought was early stage dementia but when the data came through, uh, we could see that the person was wandering about for 20 hours a day and they weren't in the right accommodation. So they got shifted out. Uh, another tenant was um, deteriorating health wise and nobody knew why. Uh, but the GP picked up that they were going to using the toilet about seven times a night. So all of this was getting picked up and passed to the GP, all with consent, all with the ownership of the individual giving that consent. Um, and um, creating a better a better outcome for everybody involved. The issues around that obviously are about privacy and who has the data, um, and that is why the, the, the whole our discussions going around about what sensors are you using is actually a fool's game. The actual big thing is where's the data going, who is owning the data, and who's giving permission for that data to be used. So we got offered free um, sensors and free equipment. Um, we got offered um, to work with one of the global insurance companies and we, did, we didn't take any of it. And I think that's the thing about social housing is we've got to start asking ourselves about who are we, what we're doing, what's our purpose. Um, and since we've got the most vulnerable in society and the illest, how can we make sure that our tenants get the most up-to-date, cutting-edge uh, AI soonest cheapest uh, and not having to wait till the big guys uh, develop a, 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 you know, it goes down the line and, and you get a cheap version. So that, that's my passion in all of this and uh, it's me finished. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks very much, Lucy. And uh, yeah, really um, uh, in interesting um, a, a series of questions to to, to ask there and, and, and talking about questions actually we've got um, um, plenty coming in um, uh, and I'll move move on to, to them very uh, uh, in, in a couple of moments time but uh, yeah just just to emphasize that Q&A box is absolutely there um, for, for you so please do um, uh, do ask away and I'll try and get through as many as possible in the uh, we've got about 15 minutes left and so I will try and get through as, as many as possible in, in that period of time. Um, uh, well, one question just kind of 
kick things off with, and it kind of comes through in some of the questions that have been um, asked so far, and certainly I think most of the presentations. Um, and it, it, in my intro earlier, I kind of mentioned that um, a barometer launched by the Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation um, to analyse opportunities and risks and challenges associated with um, innovation, data use and privacy. Um, and and uh, absolutely, I'd point the audience in, in, in that direction as, as well. Um, there are a number of issues it raises, um, and in its intro it says there's one fundamental barrier um, that, that, that it's talking about, low levels of public trust. Um, do, do you agree with that assessment, perhaps, is, is the first question, and how should the, the housing sector work with residents to build um, trust? Um, so, Daniel, I might, I might move back back to you, because it's, it's a while since we've, we've heard from you to, 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 to kick things off there, and then I'll, I'll move around the panel, but that, that kind of key issue of trust, which I think ran through quite a lot of those presentations there. So how, how are you working with residents in order to kind of build trust? Um, I think I think we've been pleasantly surprised how willing people were to get involved. But we aren't assuming that's the norm, if that if that isn't a contradiction in terms. So we, as I said, as I spoke about, we did this very much on a volunteer basis and were wanted tenants to take part with full awareness of what we would be collecting, what would we be using it for, and who could see it, including them, and making sure that they were involved in that. And we haven't had, we've had the odd person who expressed an interest, but then it didn't go anywhere. Um, but that wasn't always necessarily because they didn't like what was involved. It was more a case of they weren't around when we were doing the installations or whatever. So so we've been pleasantly pleasantly sort of surprised that more people were willing to take part, but it's it's a very small sample size, so we aren't resting on our laurels. Um I think going back to what Julian talked about, we are we are conscious that we need to be as upfront as possible with residents about what it is we're collecting and, and making sure they have access to it. Um, but with, there is also a recognition, because there are some other things we want to do with this around further you know, connection to health and things like this, that actually sometimes the council itself might not be the best person to ask because the relationship with the tenant might not be always at its best. And if the last conversation you've had with the council officer was negative and then they suddenly appear and ask, can we put some sensors in your house, that sort of leap of faith might not be one that people are willing to take so when we so, so, uh, so sorry to jump in there uh, uh daniel just 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 uh, to who, who should be having that conversation then and also uh in terms of openness how do you make sure that if it's not the council that it's kind of also very clear about what's what's happening what the kind of uh power structures are if you like so, so as as I said, there are things we want to do with regard to health and social care and things like that. So it might be that the best person to have a conversation might be the person, might be somebody from the sort of health and care world, because the data we're collecting is more about just um, going along what Lucy said around their behaviours and ensuring that they are getting up and carrying out those tasks. So they might be the best person to have that conversation with regard to these can help you, you should have them in your house, but still making sure they know that we as the council may be also privy to that information. So it might be a case of everybody needs to know who who, who is involved in this structure of, inf of sharing information, but the initial approach might be better coming from somebody else because they might have more faith in them saying what they're going to do what they're going to do is the thing they're going to do thanks very much really interesting um insight into different approaches that can be taken there and i'll come to uh, julian and chris um in, in a few moments time just to, to kind of pick up on some of those themes uh lucy i'll move to you next though because I'm, I'm kind of interested and we've had a question from Reese, which kind of picks up on some of these themes. So I'll just, I'll just put that to you. Um, so, uh, so it starts with very interesting stuff. Um, this seems like incredibly detailed data, um, referring to your presentation, LEC. Um, how did you ensure the tenants knew exactly what they were agreeing to, i.e. being followed around their, home, uh, their homes almost? Does that person know that a device uh, worked out, they visited the bathroom, say, seven times in one night? Um, is that a trust risk? Um, so how have you kind of wrestled with some of those questions and, and yeah, that broader question around trust that we, we kicked off with? So, Lucy, back to you. 
Yes, yeah, so, so we started off by going in with the censors going, this is what we're proposing to put in and this is what they do. So most of the censors uh, are actually visible. I mean, they're quite thin and small, but, but you can see them. Um, so it wasn't hidden in any way. Um, and and the, the tenant was given access to their dashboard where they could see what was coming out. We went through a whole series of... Um, uh, understanding of the uh, of the tenants understanding of what we were doing so we had leaflets we had conversations we went back and forth we didn't do it once we did it about four times we thought we were really good uh, six months after we decided to go back and ask ask the tenant what they understood about what we were doing and less than 50 percent um a uh, most of them had less than 50% um, understanding, even with all that work. So when we went to do it the second time, we thought the best way to do this is to take in an independent body. So we took in the Tenant Participation Advisory Service in Scotland. We gave them everything that we had done the first time, said, this is what we did. We got less than 50%, see what you can do. So so they got, they got about 65 to 70. But I think at that point, I realized you're not gonna get 100. So the trust thing is absolutely central because people are never, ever going to understand, all people are never going to understand everything. Um, at that point, I went off to Edinburgh University and spoke to the new professor of ethics there and said, I wanted to be the most ethical housing association. She kind of laughed at me and she said that, and it was, it was one of the things that, that struck, keeps coming back to me. And I think all housing associations um, and companies should should take this as something. She said, there's very few black and white in data and ethics. Most of it is, is grey. And the shade of grey that you choose says who you are as a company and what you are as a country. So, and, and one of the things that I was reading lately was about Facebook and what Facebook was looked at um, when it started 2008, whenever it was back then. And everybody thought it was this benign thing. You know, you could put anything on Facebook, it didn't matter. And now you've got something that is hugely manipulative, can be used to make people buy stuff or vote one way or another. And this whole thing about data and ethics is really, really important now. And I, I, I have concerns about things like Palantar and what they're doing there and who who they're associated with. Um, and, and I think we have to be really careful about where we put that data. I mean, we, we as custodians of, of, of the, um, uh, the houses and the people, it's up to us to see what the risks are. You can't expect everybody to know everything. So we should be stepping up to the plate more there and saying, are you sure you want to do this? And what are we doing with that data and who is getting it? With regard to the house, just specifically, um, the, we weren't actually looking at the, 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 the toilet data at that time. We were actually doing the falls prediction. Um, and the tenant themselves was delighted and went off to, off to the doctor because he felt he had found out what was wrong with him. Um, so there was no issue at all. And the explanation at the start is really important. And it's their data. We were only using some of it at that point, And he was using it for his own purposes. Thanks very much, Lucy, and uh, for, for the really clear answers to, to both of those questions. And um, Chris, I'll bring you in at this stage. I mean, uh, Lucy was talking there about the kind of professor of ethics and the, the kind of shades of grey. Um, but yeah, I mean, is, is this something that, that, that most of your clients are asking about? And I, and I guess also I'll kind of move on to a question that I want to ask Julian about as well. Um, and there's a couple of questions about you know what best practice is out there um uh, and and the world evolving quite quite rapidly um uh, so uh, yeah in terms in terms of um best practice advice um so not not to fred thank yeah. for for asking those those questions um so yeah are, are, are these questions up that your your clients that the, yeah. the sector is is are, is kind of pressing you on um and yeah, uh, yeah I, I just wonder where, where where you think people are yeah, so I mean, uh, it, you know, obviously we've spoken to you know hundreds hundreds of landlords now and done, done a lot of different projects. Um, by and large, most landlords ha have a you know a naturally you know ethical sort of approach and a sort of tenant first approach. You know, you don't always hear that. Sometimes a landlord, you know, they kind of talk about oh we could use the data in this way or you know understand these like illegal uses and things like that. Um, 
which you know for us early on made us think well you know not everyone views it the same way and, and not everyone views it the same way as us you know we're, we're obviously trying to have a positive impact in, in society and, and do some you know interesting stuff with technology at the same time so that's what led us into looking you know into um you know the ethics side of things and doing that research um and yeah and then for us it's all about creating you know on, on that second part of the question it's all about creating you know taking that research further taking what we've learned from it understanding what additional questions there are there are maybe putting a steering committee together in the in the sector to basically create an ethical standard or framework that that you know that the sector will, will naturally follow and sign up to uh, in terms of trust you know that ethics research brought out um, some interesting questions of trust um you know obviously there's there's a, a natural distrust uh, between people uh, and and the government maybe on a, on a slight on a slight level you know different different places and the research kind of highlight that a little bit it's not as big though as as landlords would think or people think in the sector uh, same with like worries about deploying iot and things like that like you know residents you, know, you saw from the graph that I earlier on um they're not as skeptical or worried about it as as landlords are worried if, if you know what i mean which is which was interesting Although from personal experience and particularly in the earlier days, you know, I remember, you know, when we kind of sold the idea or, you know, explained what, you know, the, a pilot to Sterling um, residents, initially they're, you know, very skeptical. Uh, we explained what, what it was, what, you know, being transparent, what it was used for. Uh, and we found that, you know, after that initial skepticism, and even even with even with Leeds, you know, they're keen to get involved. But, you know, for example, we we um, uh, when we were putting the temperature humidity sensors in, um, as Daniel was saying, we put them in the bathroom, uh, lounge, um, and kitchen. Uh, and we also asked the question, you know, if, if it was if it, if, it, if it was available, would you want these in the bedroom as well? Which we don't normally recommend because we found from the research that people are a bit more kind of cautious about that. Um, but on, and but the quote that Daniel was referring to earlier on was. You know, initially someone was like, you said, hard no, don't want them in my bedroom. But once they've seen the technology, uh, seen the response, seen some of the benefits, then they become more open to it. So in terms of trust, I think trust, you know, takes time to build up. And, you know, people are always going to be skeptical of new technologies. I mean, I remember seeing a, um, an interview, I think, on YouTube of Steve Jobs talking about computers on a, on a news channel in like the 70s. Uh, and there was and, and and he was basically having to defend that computers weren't going to take over. And there's this Big Brother uh, error and, and things like that. And obviously, there was some skepticism of them at the time. And people were naturally adverse to them. And, and, and you know, rightly so in some ways, with, as has been talked about Facebook and things like that. There's also huge advantages and benefits uh, to them as well. And I think it's important that we, we you know, keep the resident's voice heard, be as transparent as possible um, and, and do things in the way that both landlords and residents find acceptable uh, if we want to get the benefits from these technologies. We can't just force it on people and, um, you know, do, do whatever we want and not bring them on the journey. It's going to have, you know, it's, it's not strategically a sound thing to do for a landlord, but it's also not the right thing to do. So, yeah, that's why we're doing all that. Uh, thanks very much, Chris. And um, so some fee feedback from Nell, who says, uh, th thanks for your presentation slides, helping a lot in understanding the issue and Lucy's case, uh, very thought provoking. So th thanks for the feedback, Nell. Uh, Julian, I will bring you in next. Um, kind of on this issue of uh, trust, uh, interest in your thoughts, but also I, I kind of wanted to pick up on, I mean, given that there are people asking about kind of best practice and, and practice that's out there um, and uh, this kind of fast moving environment uh, kind of coming up in some of the questions. Um, I mean, in, in your presentation, you talked about kind of danger of the reliance on one whiz kid in, a, in an organization, I, I think is how you put it. But I, I, I'm kind of interested in, is, is there a skills issue for the, the housing sector or, or indeed more widely? Um, um, but, but particularly when it comes to assistive technology, certainly there have been concerns raised, I, I think, in the sector that some housing professionals don't receive the training they need to assess the needs of people, uh, perhaps, and, and the technology that could help. Um, so is, is there a kind of wider issue in terms of that kind of skills um, skills base too, and, and how best should organisations identify if they've got a skills gap and how, how to fill it? So, yeah, your, your thoughts on the kind of ethics and trust issue, but um, yeah, that, that specific question, uh, interested in your feedback. Okay, yeah, thank you, Martin. You've, you've packed a lot of questions into there. So, um, firstly, in terms of trust, <laughs> Sorry about that. As, as Chris alluded to, I think trust is something that can be, takes a long time to build up and be eroded very, very quickly if you do things wrong. And so, therefore, as an organisation, you need to be very careful to think about the unintended and the intended uses of the data. So, the unintended could be based on, if you think about uh, doorbells and child uh, baby monitors and things of that nature, there have been various uh, news articles about the vulnerability of a number of those systems. And so, 
it's important that the organization does due diligence to work out are the systems secure are the back ends secure how will we sort of do patch management how will we keep the system secure but then going to the point that i think it was uh, either daniel or lucy was making about where will the data be stored uh, because you need to have absolute clarity about where the data is going which then leads into the intended use of the data so that means you need to work very carefully with the residents and probably also the relatives of the relevant residents if they're elderly or they've got ability problems um, to build that trust by being very clear about the um, uses of the data and, and actually making it very clear what what's being used and how it's being used. Uh, you mentioned there about skills and about good practice. So um, this gets into, I think, some of the good practice side of things is there are growing numbers of standards being written. So whether it's a full ISO standard or what BSI are publishing a number of passes, so that's publicly available specifications. And they actually give some, some good guidance in terms of how you you can do various things. And one thing I'm thinking of, although it was written from a smart cities context, um, it is actually, I think, relevant in this case, and that is PARS 185. So that is looking at security in the smart cities context. And one of the key things it promotes there is the idea of having a security-minded approach. So not reliant on not having the assumption that, oh, we've installed antivirus, so we'll be okay. It's actually thinking very, very carefully, thinking very widely, going through the conversation that Lucy was mentioning there about what are all these things we're mentioning? How do we make sure that we're actually using this information in the right way? So you've got to take that very security, security minded approach first, because that has to go through everything the organization does to make sure that you don't inadvertently do something that destroys trust. And then finally, you mentioned about skills, Martin. And I think the, I think there's two sides to it. I think one is that there is, the practitioner's skills to deploy a particular technology and for new and novel technologies, then that sk those skills may be in a small number of heads. But then there is also the recognition that even in mature technologies, you need to be setting yourself up for the long term. So all of us on the call today, if, you, if somebody was to say, well, you know that work you did six months ago, can you just remember what you did and how, how to fix this? if you've done some coding or you'd, what were you thinking when you wrote that particular report? And the problem we've got is that we all rush on to so many things so quickly that we don't necessarily think about having the fact we're going to have to go back to them. So even if you've still got the skills in the organization, even if you've still got that whiz kid who set the system up, they need to be documenting what they've done, how they set it up, thinking through, making sure the code is correctly established so that anybody can go in there and sort it out most importantly that they can go in there and remember what they did so i think you it you do need to and i think going back to that comment I made about the the, the pas 185 is it's not just having a security minded approach you also need to be thinking about an outcomes based approach how do we deliver not just an output we've got x number of sensors in y number of properties you're actually delivering some outcomes for your residents outcomes for you as an organization but also that you can sustain that over the long term. Thank, thanks very much, Julian. A really, really thorough answer. And thank, thanks for uh, working methodically through the, the, the questions I hurled at you there. Th thank you very much for, uh, for that. Um, and yeah, absolutely. Some, some, some takeaways for me there, I think, about um, uh, how, how to approach things as well. Um, I'm afraid we, we have run out of time. We, we've got through, hopefully, a, a, a strong selection of the questions that were um, sent in. Um, and uh, yeah, so all that remains really for me to do is to thank our panelists for uh, some absolutely, absolutely fantastic and thought-provoking um, presentations and, and some, some, some really thoughtful answers to, to the questions that were, that were posed as well. So um, thank you all. Um, thank you very much to um, Homelink for, for, for making today possible. Um, very, very much appreciated. And uh, finally, thank you all for tuning in. Um, yeah, I hope that, that's given you some takeaways for your own organizations. Um, and yeah, re really look forward to the, the feedback. So um, yeah, thank you all. Thanks to the panelists and see you all soon. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, you. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you.